Uh, I'm John Haskell, the director of the Kluge Center, and I wanted to officially welcome you to the Jefferson Building Library of Congress. I know a lot of you have attended events sponsored by Kluge before and other library events, but some of you haven't. Uh, the Kluge Center's mission is to support relevant research by bringing scholars into residence to use the vast Library of Congress collections and, and to connect the fruits of their work to policymakers like yourselves. Tonight, one of the scholars Kluge's has brought into residence at the library, thanks to the generous support of the Carnegie Corporation, is the first Library of Congress chair in U.S.-Russia relations, Jim Goldgeier, who's seated at the far end. He, was a long, he is a longtime professor and dean of the School of International Service at American University. He's currently a fellow at the Council of Foreign Relations, as well as being here at the library. Uh, he uh, served on the National Security Council staff and is the author of numerous books on U.S. policy toward Russia, as well as uh, other topics in, 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 in international relations. Jim is founder, co-founder, I should say, of Bridging the Gap, which is another Carnegie initiative, which encourages and trains scholars to produce policy-relevant scholarship, not just scholarship meant for other scholars, including the Bridging the Gap book series at Oxford University Press. I hope you have the chance uh, on uh, either you've had the chance or will have the chance on your way out of, uh, of picking up information we have on other upcoming Kluge events, including a dinner like this one exactly one month from today with Minxing Pei, who's the Library of Congress Chair in U.S.-China Relations, featuring a discussion on trade policy with China, another, of course, highly uh, topical issue. Also, on March 21, Two of the foremost scholars on political polarization, Lillianne Mason from University of Maryland and David Barker from American University, will be here to discuss the impact of polarization on political discourse and what may be the way forward. Of course, we'll be sending you emails on, on both of these events and other things. Now that you're on our list, you're going to get emails on both of these events and other events that Kluge has upcoming in the next few months. Let me turn this over to Jim Goldgeier. He'll introduce the panelists and begin the discussion. Jim. Great. Thank you so much, John. Uh, it's, uh, it's just wonderful to be here. Thank all of you so much for coming out uh, tonight. Uh, recognize a number of faces from the event we did uh, in the fall on election interference. And uh, great to have you back here for this, uh, this evening discussion of the impact of the sanctions on Russia. Uh, I thought it would be really important uh, given the role of the Congress in this and given that a lot of the discussion is on, uh, has been about the imposition of the sanctions or the ability to maintain the sanctions, uh, I thought important to make sure we got into some kind of uh, a conversation about how to assess their impact. And what we'll do is I'll, I'll start with a set of questions for our panelists uh, and then we'll go to you because we really want to make sure we're answering the questions uh, that, that you have. Um, uh, in your jobs. Very appreciative of the Kluge Center leadership, John Haskell and his team for all they're doing to really uh, make the Kluge Center such a, such a vibrant place uh, and great to have support from the Carnegie Corporation of New York. We've got three terrific panelists here tonight, all of whom uh, have, a, have a lot of expertise, experience across a range of government agencies and administrations, so that's uh, terrific. Uh, going from the far end, uh, down toward me, Peter Harrell, uh, who's currently affiliated with the Center for New American Security, was previously Deputy Assistant Secretary for Counter Threat Finance and Sanctions in the State Department's Bureau of Economic and Business Affairs, uh, and before that served on the State Department's Policy Planning Staff. Uh, Andrea Kendall Taylor, also with the Center for New American Security, was previously Deputy National Intelligence Officer for Russia and Eurasia uh, at the National Intelligence Council. Uh, in the Office of the Director for National Intelligence, uh, and before that, an analyst uh, with the Central Intelligence Agency. Uh, and Andrew Weiss, here from the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, served as Director for Russian, Ukrainian, and Eurasian Affairs on the National Security Council staff, as a member of the State Department's Policy Planning staff, and as a Policy Assistant in the Office of the Undersecretary of Defense for Policy uh, in the administrations of uh, Presidents uh, Bill Clinton and George H.W. Bush. So. Uh, Andrea, I want to uh, start with you. Um, uh, the original theory behind uh, the sanctions imposed after the Russian invasion of Ukraine was that they would hurt members 
uh, of the elite close to Putin, uh, who would then go to him, and uh, the, the, these uh, members of the elite would then go to him uh, to urge him to change course, uh, given that the negative effect that would have uh, on, on them. Uh, you've written uh, about how he's managed uh, this problem, and maybe if you could start off by telling us something about how he manages this uh, issue of, of the sanctions imposed on uh, members of, uh, of, uh, of the Russian elite, and, and ask you whether you think that gets more challenging uh, as we approach 2024, um, especially if he doesn't make clear what his plans are until close to the next presidential election, as I'm sure you're all aware, um, constitutionally, this should be his last uh, term in office, but there's uh, a lot of ambiguity uh, surrounding his political future, so please. Uh, thanks, Jim, and thanks for having me here today. Um, yeah, as I think that there, Putin has a number of tools at his disposal to help manage the pressure of sanctions. And so um, we see that although the economy um, is won't grow more than one to two percent a year, um, and there's a lot of signs of public dissatisfaction, kind of an increasingly vocal minority uh, with the pension protests um, and uh, the United Russia Party having lost a couple of seats in the most recent election. So there certainly are signs that um, governing for Putin has gotten more difficult and the sanctions add to that picture. But he has a number of tools at his disposal to manage that pressure. Number one, he certainly has the repression tool. So he can rely very heavily on the security services and use kind of calibrated, targeted repression uh, when he needs it. So I think if things continue to get more difficult with sanctions and due to other factors that we would be likely to see him rely more heavily on uh, the security services and other repressive strategies to maintain control. He certainly has control over the public narrative and so one of the things that we see especially with sanctions is he's able to kind of uh, shift blame for Russia's economic troubles to the United States. He's very good at scapegoating and the anti-US rhetoric certainly has been a very effective tool in, in Putin's toolkit. Um, so I think it, it, when, we, when we're thinking about sanctions, I think I've argued for a more targeted approach to sanctions, given that it's unlikely, in my view, that the sanctions would have much of an, of an effect on Putin's calculus and his approach to foreign policy. Um, but the one thing that I think the targeted sanctions do, and when we're looking at the elite, is um, it helps, I would, put it like this, like in a contingency. So the sanctions alone are unlikely to get Putin to change his calculus. But if you're an elite in a authoritarian regime like Russia, I, you always want to be backing the right guy. And so you want to back the person, if you're a member of the elite, who is going to protect your interests into the future. And so you mentioned kind of the approaching term limits. Um, if you're an elite in Russia, and I think we're starting to see this, people are kind of testing the wind a little bit more about who the person is who's going to be able to protect their interests into the future. And so with sanctions on the elite, you are playing for a contingency such that if there was some sort of exogenous event, say the Tunisian fruit vendor or something like that, that you're weakening these loyalty bonds to Putin such that maybe the elite won't rally behind Putin in that kind of situation. So I think that's the way I see it, that the sanctions in and of themselves, I think, would be highly unlikely to change Putin's calculus. Um, but in a contingency like that, it's possible that it could encourage a more positive outcome. And Andrew, the other idea behind the sanctions when they were first imposed in 2014 was that if Russia acted more aggressively, sanctions would be increased. And that was true for a period, and then it wasn't. Um, and, you know, there was a lot of talk in, the, in November with, uh, with what happened in the Sea of Azov that, you know, additional sanctions should be imposed. And so given the way things have played out with uh, response to uh, increasingly aggressive action and also the lack of movement on trying to resolve the situation in eastern Ukraine. How, did, how does that affect Putin's calculations um, with respect uh, to, to how he thinks about what might happen were he to continue to take more aggressive action? 
Well, I'd just like to echo what Andrea said in terms of thanks to you and to Kluge Center for having us this evening and to everyone for, for turning out. Um, we had a sanctions program that stressed ambiguity, that stressed the possibility for escalation and used that to both create uncertainty, and Peter can talk about this in the market, and make people basically back away from Russia risk. Um, and that strategy in the 2014-2016 period I think was quite effective. Um, there was a repricing of Russia risk and a great reluctance um, from market participants to do things that would potentially put them at odds with U.S. government or uh, European governments. That, I think, importantly gets lost, had an effect on Russia's behavior. There were certain escalatory steps that it's hard to prove counterfactually that the Russian government did not pursue. It didn't escalate militarily in Ukraine after a certain point. Um, it didn't build a land bridge to Crimea, for example, presumably because it feared the sanctions that were being kept in reserve could be worse than what had been imposed at that point. The problem is, is that Russia, after, say, 2016, but some of this goes further back, basically uh, thought it was in an existential situation, the regime did, and that the sanctions were part of a Western-led effort to promote regime change in Moscow, and to remove Mr. Putin from power. And so I think that is a deeply held belief. And at that point, and you can debate when the Russian leadership crystallized their view of that, but I'd say it goes much further back, probably 2011, 2012. That led them to say, we have to respond asymmetrically, we need to respond very aggressively. And you see a series of very aggressive moves, including the interference in our election in 2016, but that, are, that basically show that Russia can take more risk, that it can tolerate more risk, and that people in the West will back off, and that that will be a way of kind of intimidating and pushing us off balance. And now, as you know, with the horrible domestic political crisis in the United States and in other Western countries, we are very insular. We're not really thinking about how to punch Russia in the nose. We're really dealing with you know, uh, a very dysfunctional set of domestic political challenges. So, and to my mind, it's a long way of answering your question. The threat of doing more has become less credible because the Russian government knows that the way the program was originally designed was not to crater the Russian economy. It was not intended to cause huge hardship and disruption for average people. It was supposed to kind of send a message that there's a price. We're not going to let you get away with aggression against Ukraine. We're not going to let you get away with interference in Western elections and all the rest of it. But we're not at a stage, given the scale of the Russian economy, given its interconnectedness in the global system, to do the things to Russia that we've done to North Korea, for example. And so the West now, and this is kind of, the, I think, the question in front of Congress and in front of you know people who think about these issues, is, is it useful for Congress or others to elevate the pressure in ways that sacrifice the unity that was so central to the sanctions program success in the 2014-2016 period? And is that the right next step? And I think that's a very complicated question that needs to be debated really closely. Right, and well, that leaves, leads me into the, the question I have uh, for Peter. For those who haven't seen it, Peter had Peace and Foreign Affairs uh, uh, in January. Uh, looking at the sanctions, and in that piece you wrote, uh, any economic pressure campaign likely to affect Russia's outlook has to starve the country's military industrial complex. Can you, for those who haven't read it, could you say a little bit about sort of what you meant by that? No, no absolutely, and I actually want to begin, uh, well, uh, for, first by thanking you, Jim, and thanking the Kluge Center for hosting this wonderful dinner. Um, but picking up on the question you put on, but making a little bit of a broader point, uh, and indeed um, a broader point that in some ways uh, very respectfully challenges the premise of your first question. Uh, I was in the Obama administration in 2014, um, and I think that, that while in 2014 a piece of the strategy was targeting oligarchs, Russian oligarchs, actually the bigger piece of the sanctions pressure strategy for the Obama administration was actually to target the Russian government and the Russian fiscal situation more than the oligarchs. And so you saw, um, although there were a couple of oligarchs uh, sanctioned, you saw with the EU 
um, uh, an arms export ban uh, to the EU, you, uh, to, to, to Russia. You saw um, capital markets restrictions on big Russian uh, state-owned enterprises to prohibit lending to big Russian state-owned enterprises. The intent of that was to force the Russian government to provide bailouts uh, to these big Russian uh, enterprises and draw down uh, reserves from the Russian government to have costs on the Russian uh, government. You also saw these um, restrictions on Russia's ability to develop unconventional oil reserves, the idea we're going to impact their oil revenues uh, over time. So I think that, that actually at the time the biggest piece of the wedge w was how do we kind of affect the Russian state and its access to the military and, and the Russian state financing. And the oligarchs were kind of a secondary piece of it. I actually think it's more over the last two years or so that the focus has shifted towards oligarch sanctions being first and foremost and sort of sanctions targeting Russian government revenues and Russian government apparatus being kind of the secondary uh, focus. Um, and I think that's actually just a very different strategic approach uh, than what the Obama administration was primarily um, uh, primarily taking. Um, you know, with, with respect to the military and industrial complex, I think, you know, we have seen Russia use uh, its military uh, uh, prowess in the Middle East in ways adverse to the United States uh, over the last couple of years. Um, we've also seen them and continue to see them derive significant revenues from arms uh, exports. Um, and, and although there are, going back to 2014, some sanctions on Russia's military, um, I do think there are a number of additional things that could be done around Russia's um, supply chain uh, and procuring uh, military components from the West for development in its military complex, and a number of military enterprises in Russia that are not designated for sanctions, and I think there could be more there, but I would actually recommend doing that as part of a sanctions approach, as I laid out in my article that focused first and foremost on the military, but also got back a bit more to what can we do, not only to go after the Putin oligarchs, but what can we do to make Putin's own government apparatus a little bit poorer here and deprive the government apparatus itself of financial resources? Um, so then let me, let me, uh, so I want to follow up with all three, with all three of you um, on the issue of um, what the, what you think the Russian government believes would happen if they actually, for example, change course uh, in Eastern, you're not going to give up Crimea, but in terms of pursuing a Minsk-like settlement uh, to uh, the situation in Eastern Ukraine, uh, you know, um, you put sanctions on, uh, and going back to the original theory, presumably uh, there, there was a notion that if the behavior changed in the direction that the United States hoped it would, uh, that at least those particular sanctions would be lifted, even if, for example, the sanctions imposed because of Crimea were not. Um, that then presumes that there is actually a belief in the, in the state that's targeted that if the behavior changes, then sanctions would be lifted. Do you think there's any belief on the Russian side? We can just start with Andrew and go down the list. Do you think there's any belief on the, on the Russian side um, or any real discussion that if, if they, they change course to, in response to the sanctions on, on eastern Ukraine, that that would lead to a lifting of, of sanctions? I, I, well, when it comes to Ukraine, I think the Russian view right now is they're just going to wait and watch and they'll see what happens in the election, and they'll hope that someone, you know, wins that election who will be more pliant and more cooperative. Um, but they're just sort of sitting on their hands. Um, there is, I think, on the Russian side, I, I, and I, you know, I haven't peered in anyone's soul, and no one has told me this, but I think a belief that the sanctions will stay in place indefinitely. And so there is no kind of desire to redeem themselves. They just sort of are now making their plans, and their plans all focus on shoring up the country's defenses against this onslaught. And so, you know, I, I take what Peter says to heart about, you know, whether we can make life more complicated, but given that this is a country with, a, you know, half a trillion dollars of currency reserves that prints money every day on the back of its exports of energy resources and other raw materials, we have a problem, which is that the state will remain pretty capable of sustaining itself. Money is very fungible. And it will put most of the burden of the adjustment to those more difficult circumstances on the back of the Russian people. 
it will not be oligarchs or the elite who pay the price. It will be Joe Sixpack, Russians, whose life in, you know, uh, socioeconomic conditions will decline. And that's the, that's the reality. Those people bore the brunt of the adjustment in 2014, 2015. And they're, they're not happy. You see that in terms of Putin's dropping, drop in popularity. But they, the government is not looking to uh, some kind of grand bargain. I think if the Trump administration offers something for free, and there have been times that were indications that that was under discussion in the Trump administration, surely the Russians will take it. But they aren't thinking that that's even realistic based on the fact of Katz's passage in 2017 that, you know, for some, you know, some degree will tie the hands of this administration. I may have answered the question. I don't know if you want, I was just going to uh, largely agree with what Andrew said, but I guess the way I think about this too is it, I mean, it's very much a cost benefit calculus for the elite, but also for the people. And so if the costs are being shifted onto the Russian people, then if we're looking at a long-term U.S.-Russia relationship and where that's going to be in the future, um, I think that that's one of the things that we need to factor in, and isn't it starting to think about what the costs of a, of a heavy reliance on sanctions are in U.S. policy? So one of the costs is that we start alienating Russians, um, and then the United States is not well positioned for a post-Putin Russia. So I think having that perspective in mind is really important. Um, additional costs of an over-reliance on sanctions also have to do with driving uh, Russia and China closer together. If they don't perceive that there is an off-ramp to the sanctions, then the elite and the Kremlin and the Russian people will think that there is not an option in the West. And so it increasingly makes them view China as a more attractive, a relatively more attractive partner. Um, and, and again, with the cost-benefit calculus, I think, I think it's really important that the United States be able to clearly articulate what the off-ramp is. What is the behavior that we would need to see to delist people from the sanctions list? Um, because so far, Putin has been able to use the sanctions to rally support around him. We have seen, I think, that the elite have kind of bandwagon with Putin because where else are they going to go? And so if you are trying to shape that calculus of an individual, they have to see that there would at some point be a future with the West. And so being able to articulate those off ramps or what it is that we would need to see to, to delist, I think is a really important piece of, of shaping the calculus. So I'd, I'd just add a couple of points. The first is I actually think that if you are sitting in Putin's shoes right now, um, you actually think your economy is doing pretty well. I mean, you pointed out, Andrea, it's 1% to 2% growth. But of course, what we saw was essentially Russia move into a recession in 2014, 2015, negative growth driven in part by sanctions and part by low oil prices. It is now rebounded and is growing, albeit slowly. We've also seen Russia um, uh, um, uh, sort of rebuild its its government balance sheet. You know, as I mentioned, part of the intent of the original sanctions was to force them to spend down sovereign reserves. They're now back at 2014 or pre-2014 levels uh, in terms of their sovereign reserves. Last year, 2018, uh, Russia um, hit a post-Soviet high in oil production, uh, by far the most important commodity uh, export and revenue source for the Russian government, the highest level of production in 30 plus years. Um, and, and so I th actually think if you're, if you're sitting in, in the Kremlin right now, yes, you've had to make a couple of tough choices. You're trying to do some domestic reforms. You're trying to change pensions. There's some growing, um, uh, growing political resistance to that. But your macroeconomic and macro fiscal position looks pretty good right now. Certainly looks a heck of a lot better than it did in 2014. Um, uh, which I, I would start by saying, so, so I, don't, I don't think right now you feel like you have to give much in order to get sanctions relief because you're not feeling a whole lot of pain from these sanctions. You've kind of adapted uh, to what was in place and you're not feeling a lot of pain right now. Now, I do take the point, I, I, I also think, you know, Putin, although back in 2014 there was kind of a clear off-ramp for the sanctions around Ukraine and Crimea, Today, there is no clear off-ramp, right? I mean, the sanctions are about Ukraine and Crimea, they're about election interference, they're about Syria, they're about, you know, cyber attacks, they're about a whole range of malign activities. I, I do very much take the point, I think that does mean if you're in Putin's shoes, you don't have a lot of incentive to negotiate over these sanctions that aren't having a whole lot of impact on you to begin with. Um, and so you're probably, you know, both on the low impact and on the, you don't know if you'll get anything for it anyway, you're not going to, um, you're not going to negotiate. Um, 
you know, I do think that is very relevant to congressional staffers as I think about potential future sanctions on, on Russia, because I do think it would be useful to try to link future sanctions on Russia to discrete buckets of activity to try to signal very clearly to the Russians, if you do X, you might get Y. If you do A, you might get B. And so I think, I think it is important to try to delineate what different sets of sanctions are for, um, rather than kind of just having it all be a mush. Right. And then before we open it up, I just want to ask a question um, related to things that you've each written about or spoken about, and that's sort of thinking about playing the long game and about the range of tools that the United States has in manage, managing its relationship with Russia. And I would just ask each of you to identify one of those tools and how you think it might be better utilized. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so, so, you know, if, if people have looked closely at the British experience since the Salisbury attack, there's been a real, you know, set of meaningful steps. There's still more room to go to make the British system, financial system particularly, and the property market less permeable to dirty money and to unwelcome visitors. And there are steps that have been the subject of legislation here in the past that have really not moved forward to try to push, push forward reforms on beneficial ownership, for example, that would do what you know Andrea said at the beginning, which is if you want to hurt and exclude certain people from the benefits of our financial system and our prosperity, we need to be much more targeted about that. And we've done a pretty lackluster job as a society, given uh, the tens of billions of dollars that the Justice Department estimates are coming in that, that you know are being laundered in U.S. real estate or U.S. financial institutions. So, to my mind, that's a really sort of first-order priority of you know beneficial ownership reform unexplained wealth orders, things like that, that you know, will require changes to how we do business and to the due diligence requirements on, particularly in the financial and real estate sector. I would agree with Andrew, as that would probably be at the top of my list. I'll add one more in a second. But one of the reasons it's so important, too, is when we're just thinking about the logic of the Putin regime, it's a highly personalized authoritarian regime, which of all of the forms of dictatorship are the most reliant on corruption and the distribution of patronage to maintain their support you know, relative to all sorts of different types of regimes, those are the regimes where the corruption matters the most. They're the most corrupt regimes because that's the way that they maintain their whole system of rule. So exactly what Andrew said, going after those illicit finance, those illicit markets and the corruption is a way to really uh, strangle the kind of currency or, or to limit the currency that the regime relies on. But to add one more thing, I think, I mean, I always go back to the, to the importance of allies and partners and a strong transatlantic relationship. And I think from Putin's perspective, I think one of the things that is the most effective deterrent is when we do things in close coordination with our European allies and partners. And it's that, that the coherence of a response that's the most important. So one of the most important, in addition to what Andrew said, increasing, um, the coherence and the relationships with our transatlantic partners is going to be one of the keys to deterring future Russian aggression. I basically just agree with both of those. I think something around beneficial ownership transparency would be very valuable uh, here, uh, here at home. I, I also do think, um, you know, there's debate in Europe right now, as in Brussels and Berlin maybe two weeks ago, you know, there is debate around um, the European Union, maybe for the first time really since 2014, doing some new sanctions on Russia. Now, they'd be pretty targeted sanctions. Um, you know, they probably wouldn't be big kind of economically impactful measures. But I nonetheless think something like that would be incredibly important to signal uh, to the Russians that, that after a couple of years of feeling like, you know, Europe was, if anything, kind of with them, rather than with the United States, no, Europe is going to stand with the United States against them, I think would be incredibly important diplomatically and politically, uh, even if the economic impact of the measure is pretty muted. So we will open it up. And as you may have noticed, the first portion of this was uh, uh, on camera for the, for the website.